Well, I have to say thank you for inviting me and letting me be a part of this weekend with you guys. It's been a joy. It's been a wonderful. And then think about being the founding pastor of this church. I feel like I should have been wheeled in in a wheelchair and have a quilt over my legs and all that kind of stuff. But I'm grateful to be here and be a part of this. It's amazing what happens in eight years and how much life is lived in eight years and what happens. It's also amazing how much doesn't change. And that's amazing and wonderful too. But I want to thank Bart for inviting me and the elders not correcting him and saying no way and being uh, worried about what I might say. But anyway, I'm thankful to be here. It's just a, it just warms my heart. I'm very grateful years ago when Chad Gilbert called me and said, hey, we're in this search committee and we're just kind of thinking, I don't know, Bart's right here. What do you think? And I don't do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I said... I said, absolutely, man, and it's just to enjoy it. And as a result of that, it's enabled me to continue a friendship and a closeness with this church that may not have happened had somebody else been called here. And so I'm very grateful that when I'm in town, I can come here and not worry about anything and be a part of this body and continue to love on you guys and so forth and so on. And I would just like to say that I've got some Bart stories too. (laughs) So anyway, it's just good to be here. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is our text as we continue our study. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 33 and 34, very familiar verses. It's just two verses, so I'm not going to ask you to stand, but if you'd sit up, I'd appreciate it. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. As we've been talking about worry these last couple sessions together, and we talk about it finally, I want to talk to you today about anxiety being extinguished. Extinguished. That's what we want to do. We want to be done with it. Now, as we talk about worry, I don't want to say that we don't have cares. We have cares, and I think the Bible fully recognizes that we have cares because he tells us in First Peter to cast our cares upon him, right? So we do have cares. We are not careless people. We are not people who don't care what happens to our kids and our grandkids. We are, we're not careless people who don't really care if I go to work tomorrow and they fire me. Woohoo! You know, it's, we have cares, and we, we, need, we need to have cares. The issue is that they do not consume us, and we don't trust God in those cares, and that we hold those cares to ourselves, and they become worries and anxieties. We take our cares, our daily needs, the things of life, and we cast them on Christ, and we trust Him for them. Anxiety and worry and fret being consumed In light of the fact that we have a loving Heavenly Father whose character is perfect in love and perfect in provision and perfect in omniscience and perfect in omnipotence is unreasonable. It's just not reasonable. Even evidence, as we said, a lack of faith. We are commanded not to worry. Not only here, but in Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. It is inconsistent with our faith in God for all eternity. It's inconsistent. Like we talked about last hour, we're saying we trust God, and the world watches us not trust God, and they're like, what's the difference between you and I? Your faith in God has not changed you, and has not instructed or informed you any differently. You're worried about everything I'm worried about. There is no peace. There's a book that was written a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, maybe by now, is simply entitled When People Are Big and God is Small. It's a great book. It's when you have more concerns about what people think than what you are concerned about God thinks, and it causes all these kinds of problems. I would like to see somebody write a book when life or circumstances are big and God is small, because it's kind of the same thing. One, we make idols out of what other people think, or two, we make idols out of the circumstances in our life and how things turn out. To worry about our circumstances is a mark of a worldly mind. Proper stewardship and wisdom need to be a part of that. But Psalm 94, 19 says, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, 
Your consolations delight my soul. The psalmist recognizes that it's easy for the cares of this world to pile up in our life and become more and more and more, but what is more important than these anxious thoughts or these things is the fact that the consolations of who God is and trust in Him, that's what ultimately delights my soul and pushes them aside. And so this morning, in our last time together, we have two final directives. One, seeking is the best priority, verse 34. Seeking is the best priority. Again, we have the little word but there, but seek ye first his kingdom of God. It's a good rendering of the Greek conjunction. I might way to help us understand, because but can mean many things, is rather. Maybe we might use the word rather. Rather than seeking the things of this world, even food and clothing, seek the kingdom and righteousness. Yes, we're seeking these things. The Gentiles eagerly, eagerly seek these things. Rather than seek those things, seek the kingdom of heaven. It is a sense of priority. Therefore, it is a sense of <coughs> focus of your life. We talked about focus yesterday. Seek means quite simply that we are absorbed in the search. It's like when you lose your keys. I don't lose my keys very often. I typically put everything in the same place. I walk in the house. I put everything in a little bowl, and I walk in my office. I put everything on a certain spot of the desk, so that way I don't lose them. Why? Because when I have, I don't like it. I don't like, do you like losing your keys? No, right now, because if you have a, most keys are got like five or six hundred dollars to replace a key. You just don't run down to the hardware store and buzz off another one. The other thing is, it's a major interruption in your life if you can't find your keys, right? Most of us have been late to something because we couldn't find our keys. I don't like to do that. And when I do, and when I have lost my keys, I, I've absorbed myself in the, the matter of nothing more than finding my keys. I'm retracing to my mind, where was I? What did I do? What could I have done? What was the last pair of pants I wore? Right? All those types of things, you're just rolling through your mind. You go to your car, and you run through everything. You look under the seat. You look everywhere. You kind of walk through everything in life to try to find and figure out where it might be. You find all kinds of things in the couch and the cushions that you never knew existed. But you can't find your stinking keys, and nothing else matters. Because if you can't find your keys, I can't do anything else. The other day I drove up to Sarah's house in Birmingham, and uh, they had just gotten back from the beach, and I don't know why, I was, I was going over for something, and I, I drove up, and the car, their van was open, all the doors were open, the kids were out, and everything, like the back seats were removed, it's just everything spread out all over the place. What's going on? We lost our keys. We can't get in the house. And like, well, we, it's one of those keys that you don't really need, it's got, it's got to be in close proximity of. Well, they drove the car there, so they had to be in close, and they're just like tearing up everything. I guess they've been doing it for like an hour and a half. And they're at the point now where they're contemplating which door do we want to kick in, right? Because we got three little kids, and we got to get in, and all this stuff, we can't go anywhere. And there, so I'm kind of joining the search, saying, well, how do, why do you have so much stuff? <laughs> I kind of forgot what it was to have three kids and go anywhere. It's just like junk everywhere, and it's stuff, and we're kind of going through everything, and working through all this, and they can't, can't go anywhere. They can't get inside to get the keys to the other car. And life stopped because they couldn't have keys. And they didn't find them, and they actually did find them after that. But there was a persevering search. It was a, it was a strenuous search. They're looking at places they could never possibly be, but maybe, Right? Maybe they're in the gutter on top of the roof. I don't know how they could have got there, but maybe, right? And they're kind of going through. We stopped here. Maybe at this rest area we stopped. They fell out, but he had, you know, we're just going through all that kind of stuff. It was a ton of effort. It was concentration. It was a search. Seek first his kingdom. Right, Colossians chapter 1, Claudius says, keep seeking constantly. This isn't a search for a little while and, oh, I got saved, so I'm good. This is a, this is a constant 
constantly, the search never ends. There is always and will always be more that needs to be gained. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's the idea of mining for treasure. And you're looking at this vein that never runs dry. You never get enough. You, you found the vein of the precious metal and you just keep mining and keep mining and keep mining. And it's not like, well, you know, I got enough. I can, I can take a little break. No, you just keep going. 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are, here we go, the theme for the week, right? Temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. And we're learning that our treasures of life are not the temporal things. We learned that Friday and Saturday. And then and now we're not worried about the temporal things, but we are, we are consumed with, and every desire of our heart is informed by eternal things. The seen things are temporal, and when you see it, it's huge and big, and when it's not seen, it can be easily removed and out of mind for the time being. It's the eye of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. Therefore, having always good, been of good courage, knowing that while we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It's our ambition the ambition of your life and my life in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9, he continues, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Notice I, I, my, my, my preference right now today is to be home with the Lord. That's, that's my preference. It's not what God has for me. We talked about this the other night, right? We, do we really believe dying is gain? right? My preference is to be home with the Lord, and all the things that would keep me from wanting to be home with the Lord, one, the Lord will take care of without you being here. He doesn't need you to take care of that or to worry about that. Or Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or present, at home or absent, to be pleasing to the Lord. My ambition is to be pleasing to the Lord. That's the ambition. That, that's it. Think about all the ambitions. Think about what you think through. Think about how you think, well, I don't know what others will think. That is not an ambition. Now, you, you don't purposely go out and offend people. And who, you, you need to be a good brother and sister in Christ. But your ambition is to be pleasing to Him. The object of this seeking is twofold. I'm, I'm to seek. I'm to, I'm to search like I would for keys if I lost them in a desperate kind of way. My seeking is to be first the kingdom. I'm to be kingdom seeking. The eternal kingdom versus a temporal kingdom is very clear. In spite of the things we could seek right in front of us, we are to be seeking and we are to be occupied with the priorities of God, the one to whom we belong. God is our king in our hearts right now, we recognize him as king, we obey him, we serve him, and we do that as the priority of our life. And we are seeking the kingdom. How does that look? What, what does seeking the kingdom practically look like? I know it's a great phrase, but honestly, it, it, it's simple. It's living under the dominion and the rule of the king. God, I submit my life to his kingdom, his rule, his authority. My life is managed by, informed by, and directed by God's agenda. I lose myself in living for Him. That's what it means. It's a sense of obedience and direction. Paul writes to the, or Paul says to the Corinthian elders on the island in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. There it is. My life is not dear. I don't consider my life as any account as dear to myself. Why? Because I'm living under God's agenda and God's direction. So that I might finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus <coughs> to testify solemnly about the gospel of the grace of God. 
I am living for his kingdom. I do not consider my life. You might say, well, Rick, that's great. That's the Apostle Paul. I, I'm, not a, I'm not in ministry. I'm not, a, I'm not a missionary. My answer to you is, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're 100% in the ministry, and you are 3,000% a missionary. Now, you should act like it. You should share the gospel. You should minister to your brothers and sisters. You should be lost in the agenda of God for his church and for the lost. We pour out our lives for an eternal work. We might think of it in the sense of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, right? Are you Jerusalem? Is your family. Do you need to be pouring your life out for your family, your husband, your wife, your kids, your maybe even your grandkids? However, I completely blowing it with my grandkids on purpose. Part of it because I love them and I want to spoil them, and part of them because I want to just be a real problem for my children. <laughs> Jerusalem's your family, guys. Each one of you are pouring your life out for the kingdom of God in your family. There are so many distractions, so many things, and so there are so many things you can partake in in this world. That's great, and do that as a family, but it is always most important that we see the agenda of God. Judea, it's your immediate context, right? Your, your work, your school, your church, it's your ministering and being a missionary in those various contexts that are there. You're pouring yourself out in that uttermost parts of the world. That may, outside of that, those things that are even beyond that, some involvement in the church for worldwide, your prayer, you take your resources and you pour them into the ministry work and the missionary work of what's taking place. All because why? To serve the kingdom means you serve the king. I seek. I seek, I search out ways to serve the king, to glorify him, to obey him, to speak of him. I spend more time and support advertising my Lord and Savior and King in heaven than I would advertise on my t-shirt, my favorite team. I'm not saying wear Jesus t-shirts. It's not necessarily cool. Not uncool. But we just walk around and we advertise everything and our loyalty to everything else so clearly. The second thing is we seek righteousness. Kingdom and righteousness are gifts. It's not my kingdom and it's not my righteousness. My righteousness is filthy rags. My righteousness doesn't amount to a hill of beans. We have three basic needs on the one hand, right? We need food, we need clothes. On the other hand, they are objects of continuous and diligent effort of seeking. Hendrickson says it this way. He says, an example from nature will clarify this. Of itself, a tree has no power to maintain itself. Its roots are, as it were, empty hands stretched out into the environment. It is dependent on the sun, the air, clouds, and soil. It does not even have the strength to absorb the nourishments that it requires. The sun is the source of its energy. But does this mean that the tree is, therefore, inactive? Not at all. Its roots and leaves, though completely receptive, are enormously active. For example, it has been established that the amount of work it performs by a certain large tree in a single day to raise the water and minerals from the soil to the leaves was equal to the amount of energy expended by one person who carried 300 buckets of water two at a time up 10-foot flight of stairs to the leaves to our virtual factories. They, too, are enorm tremendously active. So, in other words, yes... We receive the kingdom, and yes, we receive righteousness. However, we are not inactive in that process. 
God's perfect righteousness imputed and given to you and I as we strive to become more and more holy because God has commanded us to be holy like he is holy. Seeking after the kingdom of God is often viewed as just. I'm just going to sit back and wait for the millennial kingdom and Jesus to come on his throne. I, I'm seeking, I'm looking forward to that day somewhere in the future. Maranatha. Well, a perfect life. What a, what a perfect life it'll be. The lion will lay down with the lamb. It'll be incredible. Yet there's a real sense in which there's a present reality. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Therefore you have been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Christ is on the throne right now. He rules and reigns, and we serve him. How is it that we do that? Well, we dwell. We let the word of God dwell in us richly. Verse 16 of chapter 3 of Colossians 3. Peter writes this in 2 Peter, that wonderful epistle warning us about our theology and our doctrine and false teachers. Chapter 3, verse 11, since all these things are being destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You are to keep seeking the agenda of the king on the throne and live that agenda out. And part of that is that you are to keep seeking righteousness, to be concerned with your progress in holiness. You need to be concerned about your spiritual growth. It is so easy to become routine in our Christian life. You get up, you read your Bible, you do your little prayer, you move on, and easily that can become something that is a routine and not really a life-changing process. Tozer said that we are to be holy and not happy. <laughs> And so many times we strive more for happiness than we do for holiness. I personally hate, and I mean that word, I hate drama. I don't like drama. It's no fun for me. It doesn't really accomplish much, and I'm not a fond fan of it. <laughs> so I like to be happy. So sometimes I manage my life so as not to have drama, so that way I can be happy. However, holiness requires me sometimes to deal and help myself and others through drama. And that's the holy thing to do. See, true happiness is really only found in holiness. Just have to convince yourself of that. You see, we, we have this kind of fleshly baseline in our hearts and our minds that tell us that holiness might make me do things that will keep me from being happy. If I follow God, then I can't do this. Or if I follow God and try to be holy, then I have to not do that. To be holy means that I got to sit and read my Bible and I can't watch a basketball game or a football game because that would be happy. It's just not that way at all. And really you know that, but somehow we think if we really pursue happiness, I, holiness, that somehow I'll have to give up some stuff I don't want to give up. And the reality is, yeah. Yeah. But you're going to learn as you give that up, it really didn't cost you anything at all. And actually you are more happy because you pursued holiness and not happiness. It's a wonderful reality of the truths that true happiness is found in holiness. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It's, it's reminiscent of when Solomon, God asked Solomon, you know, just tell me what you wish, lead these people. He went and said, well, you know, he's, just give me wisdom to lead your people. 
And God said, because you asked for the right thing and the wise thing, I will give you all the other things. You know what? When you seek his kingdom, his agenda, and you seek to be a righteous man or a righteous woman, all these things will be added. Now, of course, the values of your life will be completely changed, right? As you're seeking the kingdom of God and as you're seeking the righteousness of God and you want to grow in your holiness, God begins to change the value system of your life. And that's what you thought would make you happy. You now realize it doesn't make me happy and you begin to pursue different things. There's a complete directional shift and a directional focus of your life. However, <coughs> things will be added to you. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich, and it doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to be able to do fleshly, earthly, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life things. It means a change in your life. But it does mean that God will add things to you. In other words, your kingdom seeking will be more, and your righteousness will be more. The second thing that we have today is the seeing the big picture. Verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, I wish I could read this verse and take my calendar and completely wipe it clean. I'm not worried about tomorrow, right? I know that's not true. And his point is there. We all know that tomorrow we shall need to go to work and go to school. You need to feed the kids, moms. That'd be a good idea, right? Right? We'd all appreciate it if you guys would do laundry sometime between now and next Sunday before you come back. We, we appreciate that. So there's things, right? By all means, take your medicine. We are to continue to make every reasonable provision for tomorrow as well that it's not consuming us. Luke 16 tells us this parable about the wise and shrewd steward because he was why is about tomorrow and to care of that? But the point is that we're not to be worried or anxious about it. One of the things that chews our hearts and minds up is the simple what if scenarios. Well, what if this and what if that? Well, part of what if is making wise contingencies, but if we're consumed by the what ifs, potential problems, even the remotest possibility of a potential problem, we can anxiously cripple people. <coughs> so don't worry. Based on all the proceeding from verse 25 to 33 and now 34, the conclusion is don't worry about tomorrow. He just says it again. Verse 31, don't worry. Verse 27, how many of you by being worried can? He's saying it over and over and over again. The conclusion is don't worry about tomorrow. The only way to live and a way caring about tomorrow, but not over caring about tomorrow, tomorrow is to live verse 33. How do I wisely take care of tomorrow, but not unwisely worry about tomorrow? Well, I do that by seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's how I do it. My agenda is informed by God, and I'm following through with that. My hope, my desire in life is to become more holy over a period of time and growing in that. And that's the conclusion. We have seen, last couple sessions, worry as wrong and even unreasonable. Let's work back through it. Just a just quick review. There's a lack of trust in God, verse 24. You cannot serve two masters. In 23, right, 22 and 23, we understand there's a preoccupation with things that are material, wealth, that confuses our values. Verse 25, the significance of what is secondary and what is primary. It defies reason in the illustrations in 19 to 21 and verse 27 and 26 and 28 to 32. It, it just defies reason reason. If God's taking care of all these things that ultimately are utterly beneath us in regard to the priority of God, will he not take care of you? And now he says, today and tomorrow. And I think Jesus in his sermon adds a little bit of humor here. So do not be worried about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Really that word is, tomorrow will be anxious for himself. 
You're anxious today, and tomorrow you can just be anxious for it. He's kind of asking, right? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Look at where he finishes it. He just says it right there, right? Each day has enough trouble of its own. As I translate that literally, it's just sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Each day's got its own problems. Do not borrow tomorrow's trouble. Don't do it. Because you don't know what tomorrow's trouble is. You think you do, but you don't. Lamentations chapter 3. The Lord's loving kindness is indeed never ceases. You believe that? His loving kindness never ceases, for his compassions never fail. You know the next, right? They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness. Every morning, there's a new faithfulness of God. So why am I worrying about tomorrow? Because tomorrow has its own faithfulness. It, that faithfulness starts all over tomorrow. Tomorrow, I start with a full tank of faithfulness gas, right? I've got, it's full. And God's new every morning. And there's not a morning that I've ever woken up that there's not mercy and grace and faithfulness and provision and direction every morning, brand new. You haven't worn it out. You won't wear it out. You don't need to worry about it. And whereas we are promised grace for tomorrow and all eternity, he gives us that grace one day at a time and full measure each day. I mean, you have grace for all eternity. Yeah, but that's there. You got grace for today. I don't know what you're waking up to tomorrow. I've had days that are breezes. You know what, God? Don't need your grace. Got this one. Foolish. I needed his grace very much. And then I woke up some mornings going, I need everybody's grace in this room for me. I'm borrowing all y'all's grace. Sorry about that. Right? I'm going to keep it to myself, and I'm going to wear it out by noon. I just how much grace is this? This day is just that huge and that big in front of me. Right? We, we've all had that to some level. And the reality is, I don't know what tomorrow's is. All right, we, we're a phone call away from, oh, my word. Some of you have received those phone calls. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You recognize that. And when you get that phone call, when you get that email, when you get that news, when something happens, every bit of grace that you 100% need is all there. You don't have to worry about it. Not a bit. Been on my small group on Wednesday nights, been going through the book of Isaiah. Man, what a book. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, The steadfast mind, the steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust the Lord forever. For in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. Verses like that are the verses we wake up to to remind ourselves that today the grace is there, God is there, the direction is there, and it's the steadfast mind, the steadfast of mind, that God will keep in perfect peace. Why? He trusts in God you. And then he says, trust in the Lord forever. For in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. We, we forget sometimes as we live in our day and age and in our context that Isaiah is writing to people, he's telling them that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and wipe them out, and it's going to be war and pestilence as all the nations around them are going to be judged. And we forget sometimes that these do not worry Verses are in the context of persecution. <laughs> you know, half of the things that we expect to come on us never come. Half of your worries and half of the things, a minimum of half of the things that you're worried about never happen.
your anxiety, your worry, your care about what possibly could be or might happen or how this might play out. Half the times when I think about how it might play out, it doesn't play out that way. And I got myself in a knot. Woke up in the middle of the night, my mind starts racing about stuff. What, 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 did, that, what did that worry bring me? Loss of sleep, <laughs> right? I like sleep. Much of our miseries are caused by imagining things that will never come at all. We are silly people. We have unreasonable concerns and fears because we have a heavenly Father who loves us, a Savior who waits to welcome us, and He cares for us more than He could ever care for any flower or any bird. We have a, we have a heavenly Father who is sovereign. We seek the kingdom. Why? Because He's sovereign. And he controls it all, and he's providential. And that providence of God is given to you, his child. Just think how you, if you could providentially care for your child, what you would do, how you could change and do. And man, wouldn't you have just created a different thing? You can't, right? So you trust the providence of the one who loves you and loves your child. He's providential. And all of that providence and sovereignty is meted out to people who he has adopted as his sons and daughters in all the grace and mercy and love, leading and guiding and directing and chastening. Don't forget that, chastening to bring us about to be what? Complete and lacking nothing, James says. He does it so that the proof of our faith, Peter writes, that would come to pass and people would see that. I got a question for you. Are you confident in your Savior's work on the cross for you? As you sit here today, is there a fixed heart Reality and a faith in the fact that somewhere back 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, his actual son, and he actually became man. He actually lived in this life. He actually preached the sermon. He actually went to the cross, and he actually died for your sins and bore it in your place so that now you stand before him justified by faith. Do you believe that? Is that a hearty amen in your heart? Yeah, not, not on your lips. I know that right? It's there in your heart. You believe that, right? Then why are you not as confident that that God will love you now? He loved me somewhere in the past so deeply he paid for my sins. And he loves me somewhere in the future so deeply that he's going to bring me home to heaven. But this gap, I got to work out. It's stupid. It's unreasonable. And it's silly. Are these things a comfort to you? I hope. I hope. We have so much work to do for the kingdom of God. And you will not be effective if you don't trust him. Father, I thank you. What a precious time it has been for me and my soul to be here. I have been so encouraged, and I thank you for, wow, just this place. Um, so many important relationships that you brought in my life, and just people... I raised my family with them, and they raised their family with me, and it means so much, and so much. 
just uh, hammering out our own sanctification and meeting rooms and counseling and all the way through, you give us these important relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are beyond precious. And so I thank you for that, and I thank for you for the faithfulness of this church. But I know that the only faithfulness of this church is here because of your faithfulness to this church. And I pray for the leaders and the continue to guide and direct. May they be wonderful, loving men. And may they seek first the kingdom of God. And I pray for the husbands and fathers. Maybe they need to go home and confess some sin and screw down their level of faith and lead their wives in a trusting way and point them to Christ. And may these wives just get behind their husbands and may they grow in their own spiritual lives and may they be firm and forthright and may they give no husband their husbands no choice but to trust in you and may together they build the next generation. It seems as though this church knows how to have babies. May they learn how to grow babies in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Father, The enemy would love to get his hands in this church. I pray that you'd beat him back. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.